we appreciate everybody joining us. I'm Sue Wilsey. I'm the Director of Strategic Marketing and Communications at Helen Plum Library. And tonight we have the opportunity to present an update of our plans for the new Helen Plum Library. Today, we're gonna to present updates on the new building. Um, our construction and design teams will showcase exciting features of the new space. Our interim director, executive director will explain how the library has a positive financial outlook after the project delay and with the accumulation of funds. Uh, before we begin, we do wanna take a moment to thank the village of Lombard, their staff and officials for all of their support on this project. And of course, we want to thank all of the members of the Lombard community. We have prepared a little video that uh, shows a timeline, a uh, time lapse of the progress made at the construction site since the beginning of the year. We'll have a link available to view it on our YouTube channel. And we'll also have it posted on our website shortly if you do want to watch it again in its entirety. Uh, before we begin, let's meet our building project team, and I'd like to ask each member of our terrific and tireless team to introduce themselves and their role in our project. Claudia, if you could start, please. Yes, I'm Claudia Crosby, and I'm the Interim Executive Director at Helen Plum Library. Thank you all for taking time to join us. And by way of identifying a few more of the library um, administrative team that are participating tonight, Christy Leslie is our marketing manager. Ann Luzanecki is our assistant director, and Michelle Peterson is our patron services manager. Um, if you see their names on the participant list, you'll know that they're part of our library team. Passing it off to you, Sean. Hi, my name is Sean Kelly. I'm an architect with Enberg Anderson. I'm one uh, member of a larger team of architects and engineers that have been working with the library and the community uh, on the design of the new library. I'm also joined today by Jason Cooper. Hi, thanks, Sean. Yes, I'm Jason Cooper. I'm a landscape architect. I'm with Environmental Consulting and Technology. Uh, we worked with Engberg Anderson on the design of the site surrounding the building. And so I'll be jumping in on the conversation talking about those features. John, you want to introduce yourself, please? Sure, absolutely. I'm sorry, Sue. I'm slow on, slow on the draw. My name is John Eleonardo with Frederick Quinn Company. Um, we're the construction manager for the project. Um, we've been with uh, working on and assisting the library since uh, for about four years on developing this project. And that process for Frederick Quinn has included myself, Jack Hayes, Fred Morano, and now Eric Schmidt, who's our on-site project manager. So we're Excited to participate in the culmination of this project. Well, thanks to all of you for all of your talents and your efforts. And now on to the design. All right. So uh, the presentation today, I will walk through some of the site design features with Jason, uh, look at the exterior, and then we'll walk through some of the interior plans, the services, and the images. To start off, uh, I wanna make sure that everyone understands where the new library is going. So I have a aerial site plan of Lombard here in the show's Main Street and Hickory. So our property is gonna be on the old Mr. Z site and then also part of our property is a small um, commercial property that we acquired as well. So the dashed line here represents the property line for the new Helen Plum Library. Uh, throughout the process, uh, we went through many iterations of the site design and ultimately we ended up by placing the main structure, the building along the Main Street and Hickory Corner up in the Northwest area. The parking uh, wraps through the site. We have a curb cut along Hickory and on Main Street. Other features that you'll see in here is this roundabout area. This is a book drop. So you come in, you would drop your books here into the building. And then uh, a new feature is a service window, which is located about three car lengths up. So this would be where you could put um, books on uh, hold for pickup. You can drive in and, and get those. And there's other services available there as well. 
Um, other features about the site to point out, we're going to go into a little bit more detail later, but we have a north plaza that's accessible by the building and a small south one accessible here. We have some bike parking near each of the entries. Um, the majority of the accessible parking are near this entry. When we get into the plans, it'll be a little bit clearer to see, but we do have two entries to the building. We have one off of Main Street that you can walk in right here, and then we have another one off the parking lot here, and these link together. You'll easy to see that when we, we move on to the plans. I'm going to turn over to Jason now so he can walk through the, the majority, the big site elements, <laughs> design elements. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, so I get to talk to the pretty picture here. Uh, there's the same site plan, but in color. And a couple of the features that I think are important that I'd like to point out um, have to do with the location of the building. Um, I do think it's an improvement over the current design. We have residential neighbors to our east and to our south. And by moving the building over, we, we pull the, the main building further away from that property line. We do have parking in between the building and the property line, um, but our grades are about, um, the parking area is about four or five feet lower than the surrounding residential property. And there's a six or eight foot high wood fence on top of that to further screen those cars. So we're hoping that, um, that that will be an effective screen. Plus we have a very dense vegetative buffer along that property line. Um, the other benefit of moving the building over is it um, continues that street frontage of downtown buildings that happen up north on Main and allows the building to really serve as the Southern anchor for the downtown business district. Um, and while we're talking about Main Street, I'll point out that I think the sidewalk is an improvement also. Um, the village has four traffic, four driving lanes and then a center turn lane, and they have very limited right of way beyond that, which is why the sidewalk is so close to uh, the street for most of the length of Main Street. Um, being a, a Lombard resident myself, I've walked the street many times with my young children. I've always felt it'd be nice to have the uh, sidewalk further away from uh, the busy traffic. And the library agreed, and so they're actually allowing um, a portion of the public sidewalk to be on the library property here, which allows us to move it away about seven feet from the curb. And you can see the trees there uh, also gives us room to build planters with street trees. So we feel like it'll be a much nicer walking experience uh, along Main Street uh, because of that. Um, you'll also notice there's a lot more green on this plan than uh, the former Mr. Z site had. Um, the former Mr. Z site was nearly 100% impervious, uh, so that means that it had um, paved surfaces and, and roof areas that don't uh, accept and infiltrate rainwater uh, as opposed to a pervious surface. Um, so we've actually improved that situation and there's about a net 20,000 square foot increase in the amount of landscaped planted area, which is great for um, just shading the parking lot and creating a nicer experience for users moving around the building. But it also really helps um, the site from a stormwater management standpoint. Uh, because we were actually reducing all of this impervious surface, the library was not required to provide detention or treatment of rainwater by the county, but they did a lot of that anyway uh, to be good stewards. Uh, and on a picture I'll show you in just a minute, you'll see the bioretention planters that are distributed throughout the parking areas. Um, and so a lot of this green space is both beautiful and functional. There's, I think, 63 new trees planted on the site, which is a net increase of well over 30 uh, from the existing condition. We're also preserving a few trees around the perimeter. And Sean mentioned the um, plazas. We're going to talk a little bit about those. This is an older rendering, so the, the black and white graphic Sean presented to you earlier is actually a little more update, and you'll see a more update version in a second. But first, I want to show you what that bioretention planter looks like. Um, what it is, it's just a, a shallow, uh, shallowly depressed planted area. This is an example of a very similar feature we designed and had built in northern Indiana. And it's a, 
depressed about um, four or six inches below the adjacent pavement and allows that rainwater runoff to first go into here before it overflows into the sewer system. And so for smaller rain events, that water goes through the soil where it's filtered and the plant roots and the soil microorganisms break down pollutants. So you, you can imagine all of the, um, you know, the dirt and the oil that comes off of parking areas, it first gets cleansed through here. Um, and these are all around the parking lot. So this will be a, a great benefit to the downstream water resources which for this project site uh, is Salt Creek. So if you've ever been on Salt Creek or walked around it, um, our library is doing its part to make sure that water stays clean. Next slide. Um, the terraces I'm really proud of around the, the north and south ends of the building. They actually extend the indoor environment. When Sean starts to talk about the indoor floor plan, I want you to remember these terraces. Um, because they really expand that footprint out into the outdoor environment. So on nice days, uh, these spaces can be programmed. They're paved with what will look like stone pavers. It's actually a precast concrete with a nice stone finish. So it's a very premium surface, lasts really long, uh, doesn't have to be replaced. The surface itself is also permeable. So the joints between these blocks will be filled with a small aggregate chip and rainwater can move through that chip into a storage layer below. Um, this is a pretty robust uh, paver area. Um, it, it's laid over a permeable concrete base. So you can expect that it will be razor uh, smooth or laser smooth, you know, um, and won't undulate like some um, you know, patio block pavers might do. This is a, a pretty robust commercial application. So it'll last a long time. The other thing we have at our um, terraces are planter walls. Um, both terraces are pretty close to uh, the edges of the site or the edges of parking lots. And we wanted to create a sense of enclosure. Um, and we were doing that through these planter walls, which you can see a cross section of in the drawing in the upper right here. So it's like a, a slice through that planter wall. It'll look like a brick uh, little planter. It's faced with brick and there'll be vegetation planted on top of it. Um, the walls also have uh, built-in seats suspended off the inside edge of it. So these fixed seats provide for a lot of additional seating in the, the patio area. Um, though the library will have movable furniture that during certain events they might choose to bring out into the, the terrace area. And the graphic on the left shows you kind of the scale of that with those um, four top tables. Next slide. This is a, a beautiful rendering that Engberg Anderson uh, had done of that North Terrace. This is probably going to give you a much better idea of what it will actually look like than the description I just gave to that black and white uh, graphics. So we'll, we'll sit on this for a second. You can see the two um, high bay doors that will open up onto the terrace. Those come out of public conference rooms. So that'll be a very nice feature. And the shady north end will be particularly nice on uh, warmer hot days. Uh, this will be a nice cool respite area. You see the bike parking there. Um, there's two areas of bike parking. One is located right off of the east entrance, which is just around the corner. You can kind of see people in this graphic walking around to the main entrance. That would be the entrance you use if you parked in the parking lot. There's another one on the other side of this building uh, right next to Main Street, and there's bike parking located there as well. Next slide. This is the South Terrace. Uh, and here we have a photo of what that um, raised planter wall looks like. Um, we're using it at the South Terrace also. And because we're much closer to parked cars here, you can see the plan graphic on the left shows that terrace and the parking spaces. Um, this is coming off of the children's area of the library. And we really wanted to enclose it, make it feel intimate, and also shield it from the parked cars. So in addition to that planter wall, there'll be a wire mesh screen 
installed on top of the planter wall, which will have vines, flowering vines trained on it. So it'll be a very pretty wall, very nice to look out at from inside the building, but will also create a nice secluded private space uh, from the terrace area. Next slide. I'm gonna show just a few images of plants because I love plants. So I uh, hope, hope we have at least one other plant lover on the, uh, on the call. Um, but I'm sharing some plants that show the um, change of the plants through the seasons. So this is the spring palette. And I'll point out that we use both native plants and non-native plants in our um, planting designs. Um, many natives are fantastic for our use, but some of the environments we're putting plants into are, are not actual representations of native plant um, environments and ecologies. And so we often rely on hardy, non-invasive, non-natives, and sometimes cultivars of native plants if you really want to get um, technical. Um, but there are a number of plants on here that will be coming up in early spring. And there's familiar ones over on the right, the, the daffodils. Um, they're not native, they're from Asia, but they're beautiful. Um, the grass in the middle is a native sedge. Um, and the point of using all these different plants, the grasses, the flowering perennials, the bulbs, is to make sure that we have the ground covered um, you know, throughout the growing season. This reduces the need for um, mulching. It reduces the need for weeding. Um, and many plants will only be uh, have vegetation up during a certain part of the year. So exa for example, the bulbs, uh, they'll, they will have died back in you know, June. Um, some of the warm season grasses won't even start to come up until uh, July. Uh, and then some of the flowering perennials, they, they fit into that in-between space. A plant on the lower left, I, I like to point this one out. Um, this is a hybrid witch hazel. Uh, we do have a native witch hazel also. Uh, both the hybrid and the native flower early, um, the, the vernal uh, witch hazel at least, flower early in the year. Uh, so it's just a fun plant because uh, in late February, even early March, uh, if you know what to look for, you can see some of the first flowers of spring uh, from these shrubs. Uh, they're little tiny yellow flowers. And I'll give you a secret. If you, if you breathe on them, the, the warmth from your breath actually uh, releases the scent of the flower and it smells like cotton candy. So that's a little surprise for you. There's a fantastic vernal witch hazel in Lilacia Park closer to the park district headquarters. So look for that in March. I'll just go through the next slides really quick because we've talked enough about plants, but this is our summer palette. Again, a lot of grasses, a lot of flowering perennials and bulbs. Um, we have uh, two different types of lilacs that will be going in on the site. We are the lilac village. So I wanted to make sure we had good representation from that genus. Last slide. And hopefully the landscape will still be interesting in late fall and even in the winter. The lower right uh, image shows our native white's wood aster, Aster divericatus, that's actually flowering right now and flowers through to the end uh, of October, certainly, and sometimes even into uh, November. And then a myriad of, of fall colors and hopefully some interesting bark from some of the trees in winter. And with that, I'll uh, let Sean talk to you about the building. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, as I go through, please remember you can uh, send any questions or, or chats to Sue, and then she, we can uh, try to answer questions as we go. Uh, but there's also time at the end if you have uh, some as we keep as we finish up. So I'm just going to walk through a few of the exterior images. This is an image from the northwest corner of the property. So this is Main Street here, and this is Hickory over here on the left. So what you're seeing here is the elevation that faces west. We have our main entry. Uh, closer to the corner of Hickory and Main. Uh, we have some bike racks here that we talked about below. In the north corner, we do have a double height kind of atrium space within the building. We have an image of that coming up later, uh, kind of a dramatic view over here. You can see the terrace, north terrace we we're talking about earlier. The materials of the building are primarily masonry brick, which is represented by this light uh, color here. We also have a lot of glass, which is located throughout the building. And then within the glass, there is some metal 
panel areas. This is really a transition between the glass and the brick and also some sun shading devices that happen in different areas along here. Uh, this is also I wanted to point out that there's the, you can see the sidewalk and the tree planting zone. Uh, I do wanna make this disclaimer, the rendering program that we use only has a certain selection a number of plants and options that we can use. And this does not represent the full um, variety of plants that Jason has uh, included on our site. We just don't have the full, that many plants in our library. So we did our best, but this is not uh, fully accurate of what Jason is planning. This is an image of the Northeast. So we're looking within the parking lot. Uh, here's the East entry. It does cut through the building with this uh, double height or this uh, light scoop that you'll see in some other images coming up. We have bike parking in the back. You can see uh, the majority of the parking lot is in here. Uh, in the kind of the upper left of the image, you'll be able to get a, a view of the book drop drive and service window. So you'd enter in here. This first stop is a, is a book drop. You can deposit your books into the building. And then we have three cars queuing here, which go into the service window, uh, which allows you know, for a hold pickup, uh, and other I, um, services the library will offer. Uh, I'd like to point out that this is a 20 foot wide drive lane, so you can pass through. If you come in to drop your book, you can uh, go around. So there's enough room for two lanes of traffic here so you won't get stuck in any lines. Uh, again, here's the North Terrace here. Oh, uh, another material that it, we have an accent material that occur, occurs two places in the building. Uh, it is a cement board, kind of a multicolored brown um, si uh, paneled system here. This is an image of the Southwest. So you're traveling north on Main Street. Uh, this is that West facade we were just talking about. The South facade also has a piece of that accent material as it wraps around. We have the children's uh, garden or terrace in front here that has access to a program room you'll see in a little bit, uh, and a lot of glass windows and some sun shading devices for the south. Uh, this is the last exterior image as we walk around the building. This is looking in the southeast. Uh, we were just looking at the entry here. This is the east entry, the book drop drive, another, another view from the other side, uh, some additional glazing and masonry area. This is uh, the south side also has the staff entry and service area for the library. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go through the plans first, and then for the first floor, then I'll, I'll show you a few images, second floor, and then a few images there, and we can wrap up uh, the, the building presentation. So on the first floor, I wanna orient you first, uh, Right now, north is to the right, so this is Hickory, and Main Street is on the top. We rotated it because we're able to uh, get the building a little bit larger because it is more of a, a rectangular building. So I like to start out with, we have a west entry right here, and we have an east entry on this side, and these do link together within the building into this hub space. And the hub is really a center of activity that kind of brand, allows us to branch off in spokes into different services that the library offers. So as you come in here, if we start on the right, we've got the community room here. This is a 100 person meeting room with a, a acoustical partition, which will divide it into two 50 person rooms. We also have operable glass panels here that you've seen in the images that can spill out onto the North Terrace. Uh, within the hub and in the upper right are the featured book, new books, collections, a lot of face out, um, real easy browsing. That's really an intention, a lot of seating here. We have a vending cafe. Uh, as we keep going around, we've got some public restrooms and then the main public service desk is also located right here. Uh, everything is tried to be really centrally located. We have our main grand stair that goes up to the second floor as well as our main public elevator as well. The first floor's uh, largest department is actually the youth services area and that is located right in the center of the hub. So as you come in here, you can walk along a path way that will bring you back to the youth program room. This is another um, uh, gathering space which has an operable partition. So this can be split into two rooms or one large room and has access to a south outdoor terrace. Uh, the main uh, older kids or juvenile collections are located along the the bottom here, we have some featured collections. 
The area here is really picture book bins, kind of the lower shelving. We did that so that we can let as much light into the space as possible and really take advantage of those views. Uh, at the uh, upper right corner here, this is the expanded robin's nest. We know this is a very popular area and we wanted to do uh, our best to expand and maintain the services that are within there. Other features that I can point out in these services are a mother's room. We do have two family restrooms, which are really intended for the youth services department, a little craft maker zone, and the series of study rooms that are also there. The green area at the bottom here, and a little bit of this gray, this is mainly staff space. So this is where the book drop happens and the service drive window, and a couple of different staff departments here that serve the spaces on this floor. This first image here is coming in from the parking lot. So we're at the east entry looking west. Uh, on the left here, we have our patron services desk. You can see the face out book displays here. All of these displays in this floor are on casters so we can move them around and, and rearrange as needed. Uh, you can see on the right here, the wood area, that's the entrance into the meeting room. And up top here, uh, we're bringing over some of the existing uh, stained glass panels and incorporating them into the design of the new building. This next image is we've walked into the meeting room. You can see that we do, there is space for an operable partition, a large glass operable panels here on both sides, a lot of AV equipment. Uh, and then in the back here, we also have a demonstration zone for different types of programming. Everything in here is mobile and flexible. The intent is really to be um, as usable to the community as possible. This next image is of the two-story space that links the first and second floor. So you come here, you can see the grand stair that brings you up. On the right here, we have our vending cafe, and you can see the uh, face out and browsing collections uh, that are all on casters and can be rearranged as needed. Um, other things, you can see the friends book sale as well as patron services way in the back here on this image. Uh, moving now into youth services, this is a view um, you can see Main Street here out the windows on the left. And then this is looking into the Robin's Nest. So we do have a glass uh, wall around it and it kind of separating out a lot of the active space from some of the rest of the space and new services. You can see some computers in the foreground. As we turn around in the space, we can take a look back and see the program room in the back, picture books, uh, juvenile collections, some little uh, found seating spaces throughout here. And then you can look into the uh, craft, or craft zones as well as some additional computer and uh, seating areas. Uh, in the back of the youth services is the program room. This is the image of that. So we also have that same operable partition in here that can get closed, separate this into two spaces. We have a, a better view of like flip top mobile tables. So this can all be moved out of the way and rearranged for maximum flexibility and then access out onto that south terrace. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention before, but I but I do want to uh, bring up is that uh, the I'm going the wrong way. One second here, the public uh, community space as well as the program room, and when we get to the second floor of the conference room, are all equipped with an ALS assisted listening system. So any hearing impaired um, members of the community will have full access to programming through that system. Moving up to the second floor, I start at arrival. So you come up the grand stair or take the elevator. You arrive in the same place and you can uh, in visual sight of the main service point on here so to answer any questions that you might have. We have a second floor hub that operates just like the lower level hub. So we tried to locate as many services around this area as possible uh, to make it more of like this, this wheel and spoke type of deal. On the top here, we've got Studio 411. We've got some images of that coming up, more of a content creation space. We have some second floor restrooms. Um, down here, we have public computers and a computer lab available for programming. A 20 person plus conference room is located right here. And in the corner, we have the teen collection and teen club room, which we have an image of later. As you keep walking uh, south or to the left of the, the page here, we have the main adult collection, uh, fiction, nonfiction, study rooms, uh, plenty of different seating options that are available to the public, as well as two family restrooms that are located uh, on this floor as well. 
Just like the lower level, the green space is really the staff space. We've got adult services, tech services, some administration areas located on this floor as well. The first image would start out in Studio 411, and this is really intended to be this content creation, very flexible space. We do have an operable wall here, so we're able to open this up for drop-in programming or close it up to have more uh, specific we're closed in programming uh, so that it does, noise doesn't spill out onto the floor. This would be where you might find like a 3D printer or other devices. Uh, directly across the way on the other side, uh, this is the 21st and plus conference room. This has um, projection screens, operable uh, uh, integrated AV system. We've got the ALS system in here. All the furniture is still flip top and mobile, so we can move it out of the way and really reconfigure the space as we need based on the programs. Just to the right of that, we're just looking in the conference room over here and we're moving to the right. This is the public computing zone. And then we've got that computer lab in the back. This also has an operable partition. So these computers can be used by everyone when there's a program not in session, then when there is a program, they can shut the door and um, really focus on the, the needs of that, that program that is being offered. Uh, that furniture is also mobile and it's just another flexible space within the library. Uh, this is an image of the, of the teen club area. So we put in a glass wall between the collection side, which has the, the main, embodies the main collection as well, some study rooms and computers. And then this side is really more of a space where you, uh, louder or more conversations can happen uh, within a, a closed area so it doesn't filter into the rest of the floor. Uh, we've got a fireplace and um, some display areas talking about some of the historic, historic elements within the library. This is located uh, on the adult side of the second floor. And then uh, looking the other way, we have, this is the windows along Main Street. We've got some flexible seating here. You can see some of the collections here and study rooms that are available. Uh, this is pretty much the last slide of the building design. I wanted to let everyone know we do have a basement. It's not very large, but it really encompasses the majority of the mechanical and electrical equipment. We did carve out a little place for storage, but generally this is a mechanical basement. I think that's all I have for the building. So I don't know if there's any questions, Sue, that I can, I can answer. Um, I haven't seen any questions yet, um, but please feel free to type them into the chat box and uh, we'll make sure that they get addressed. Um, and just thank you, Sean, for that. Sean, this is the fourth presentation that we've done in the past two days and Sean's done the primary work here. So we appreciate all of that. Um, but the next uh, thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how long is this going to take and what are some of the key things that we can take a look at along the way? Sure, thank you. Um, the, the graphic you see represents a, an outline of the schedule of construction will take place over the course of the next 14 months as we move uh, to complete the building. Um, we started in early June with the demolition of the two buildings on the site and prepared the site for um, the new construction, which is what you'll see as you drive by the site. It's a little difficult to see with the fence, but as you saw in the, in the video that Sue presented, um, we have dug the basement and are in the process of just wrapping up our concrete foundation walls. It'll be followed, as you see on the graphic, by stair towers, elevator stair towers, and then steel structure, which are the components um, that will be installed over the course of the next couple of months, leading um, through October into um, the end of the year. From there, we'll be working on building the building skin or the envelope of the building so that we can close it in. And that will include the masonry, the, uh, the cement panel walls, and then putting the roof on the building in hopefully late winter and early spring of 2022, all leading into the work on the inside of the building as we start to build out the spaces, all the rooms, um, all the electrical, HVAC, and the components that, uh, that are on the inside of the building, which will take us uh, the greatest part of next year leading to construction completion at the end of 2023. It's a fairly 
um, straightforward um, construction cycle. It's pretty conventional at this point. So um, we're happy to be working on it and uh, keep going. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I, I apologize, I stepped away for a second. I, I don't see any questions at this point. So let's keep the program moving along here. And next we're going to discuss uh, the finances of the project, Claudia. Um, just a quick, I, I was typing this in the chat box. I know, John, you just said construction completion end of 2023, but construction completion end of 2022 with our move in the beginning of 2023, right? Yep. Yeah, in case I misheard. I don't want anybody panicking that this is going to go through through 2023. So no, I misspoke. I'm sorry. I meant 2022. I'm sorry. Well, it was that 2023 at the end of that timeline that caught you. I'm sure. So I I know you know, but um, anyway, um, moving on to our uh, silver lining to the delay. Um, many of you may have already had an opportunity if you received the 411 program guide that we put out quarterly. Um, this fall edition had a special building insert, and in that, um, this information that you see on the slide was included. We wanted to take a few minutes in, in the event that you have not had a chance to review this, or if you um, have any questions about it, to cover a little bit of this detail. Um, in this period of delay that we've had since the referendum passed in 2016, um, a question that we get not infrequently is where are my tax dollars going? Um, there's no new library. And what I want to reassure you about is the fact that the tax dollars have been set aside for this building project. Uh, each year, our accountant has looked at our tax revenues from the county and prorated them saying, this is how much money you would receive had the referendum not passed. And that's been our operating budget as we continue to work in the, the building on Maple Street. The prorated portion that has been intended for the building and operations in the new building has consistently been set aside in our capital building fund. What that's done is allow us over time to accumulate effectively a larger down payment on the project. And that has offset the amount of um, funding we need from the bonds. So instead of our 22.3 million bond issue, um, we had a $15 million bond issue. Um, the other factor that's been in our favor in the last several years is that the bond rates, despite the little volatility that we saw happening in the spring um, of this year, uh, have been, um, low or lower than they were several years ago. And we got a strong positive bond rating. So we were able to finance at what we consider a fantastic interest rate. Uh, I would also add that our trustees throughout the conversations about the building financing um, have wanted us to honor the 20 year request for funding for this building um, from the taxpayers, which is why this financing is happening over 15 years. So the net of all this is, instead of needing 1.6 million out of our budget for 20 years to pay back the bonds, we will need 1.12 million approximately for 15 years. Um, if you have the immediate question of what's happening with that differential of about $480,000, that's yet to be determined. It's possible that our trustees will choose to set that aside for an earlier payoff of bonds, which could happen as soon as 2029. It's possible that they could look at um, other options. One thing might be solar panels, which are something we did not include in the construction project. Um, with the exception of designing a roof that will support them. So those conversations are going to continue. Um, we, we don't want to make any final decisions on this until all of our costs are known, we're in the building, and we haven't had any surprises through the project. But I would reassure you that I think we are fiscally conservative and responsible as an administrative team, and our board is as well. Uh, if you have any questions on this, we know we'd be happy to try to answer them. And if you have any questions in the future, 
please, please feel free to reach out. So I don't see any questions coming in over the chat here, but we'll give everybody a few moments to uh, type them in if they have any questions before we finish the program here. Um, and as I had indicated earlier, if you think of any questions later, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Uh, my email address will be at the last slide here coming up and you can contact me there. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I'll certainly find out for you. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, I'll give you one more moment to see if there's anything coming through. I don't see anything here. We certainly appreciate everyone taking time out of their evening, uh, all per our presenters and of course our audience. And um, we really, really look forward to seeing you at the new building and Main Street. And um, if you want to join our mailing list, please go to our website and sign up for the email newsletter that you can receive to get instant updates or look at our page on the website uh, on the new building. And we look forward to um, a big grand celebration in 2023 with all of you there. Have a good rest of the evening, everybody. Thank you.